This conference will now be recorded. <laughs> Sean, what have you seen in the past quarter? Yeah, I think I've seen um, a lot of interest in moving uh, liquid cooling forward, but I'm um, making sure we're doing it in the right way and going from there. But uh, yeah, I do see that as well. Do you see a, a transition to um, cloud scale deployment versus uh, a megawatt here and a megawatt there? Uh, it depends who the customer is or the, you know, whether it's a hyperscaler or a colo. Um, it can vary depending on their needs and their workloads. I think Absolutely. that it, it would be Go fair ahead. to, it, it would be fair to say that maybe we don't see uh, at, at scale deployment yet, but we definitely see at scale willingness to be ready for deployment. I think that's a fair way of putting it. And there's the challenge our industry faces because being ready for, um, uh, we'll see later on, 2.1 uh, gigawatts of leases. In many cases, people are, I've talked to industry and people are saying, I've been told to sign up and be available to add liquid in my existing data center um, or my next data center design, but they don't even have the details and exactly how I'm going to be doing that. And there's some fundamentals that we could be talking about that won't change. I mean, fundamentally, you're going to be looking at a certain type of pipe and a certain size of pipe um, in your industry and a certain temperature range of design. But there's some other aspects that could be controversial, could be um, restrictive on, on uh, and we don't want to restrict technology. Um, but there's a huge challenge and opportunity, and we'll be talking a little bit about that as we go through. So I'm going to go ahead and, and um, start the call with a quick uh, run through here. Um, kind of what I've been saying before, maybe repeating it a little bit. Lots changed since the last update. What you're seeing from this screen is 2.1 gigawatts um, of data center leases signed in the last 90 days in the U.S. market. Okay, That's 2.1 gigawatts. That's a lot of data centers in a 90-day period in the U.S. market driven by um, uh, uh, AI requirements, and to a large extent, more and more people are saying that is um, uh, liquid cooling. What you're seeing here, I try to come up with some clip art to describe this, and uh, I couldn't find any clip art that was easy, and lo and behold, I just went to an AI function and typed in tsunami and data center, and that's the picture you're seeing. And that's just one of a zillion applications that are driving our industry toward uh, AI, and to a large extent, that's synonymous for many people with some sort of liquid to the rack, liquid cooling. Um, so uh, just a real quick background on OCP. In 2011, OCP was founded on principles of enabling IT deployment at cloud scale with open approaches that would provide benefits of impact, including efficiency. And in 2011, we were primarily looking at air-cooled IT. That No one was really looking at cloud scale deployment of, of uh, liquids. Um, 2017, I think Ralph, you might know more than I, um, somewhere around 2017, we started some work streams on uh, immersion cold plate door heat exchanger. Is that a fair statement there, um, Ralph? Well, in 2017, that's when, uh, that's when we found, or 26, uh, 2018 is when the advanced cooling solutions were founded, and we're celebrating the five-year anniversary, at the, uh, uh, anniversary uh, at the upcoming Global Summit which takes place uh, uh, exactly five years after the first ACS calls were uh, uh, publicly managed. So it's uh, uh, the ACS solutions were started in... Uh, I was just looking for a, a timeline. <laughs> we'll go into a little bit more and we'll, we'll talk. But yeah, fundamentally, we started doing something around 2017, 2018. Um, and then uh, in uh, 2020, um, a lot of people weren't traveling much, including myself, and I was uh, um, volunteered time with OCP and was invited to start up this program called Advanced Cooling Facilities, which is how to bring in liquid-cooled ITE into operating data centers. And we had a campaign around, show me your megawatt, where we went to the different providers of liquid cooling and said, what's a megawatt of your footprint look like? Just so we could help data center owners and the colos try to determine um, what would it take to provision to add a megawatt here and a megawatt there? Um, and so we had advanced cooling facilities show up. 
then around 2022, uh, we broke out cooling environments as its own project. And at the same time, we also launched heat reuse because as we looked at the concepts of liquid cooling, especially as you go to cloud scale, um, the potential for a much more usable, viable um, uh, solution for waste heat um, became a viability. And we're going to talk about that. Um, but then 2023, literally, we've seen just a huge, unprecedented change in data center requirements. Um, I'm hearing, I mean, in 2022, people were saying, oh, yeah, I'm getting maybe a request for a megawatt here. And, yeah, we have some plans. We put in a six-inch uh, tap-off or an eight-inch tap-off just to make sure that we can support something in the future. Or we're going to use our, our CDUs to add liquids, um, take off on our CDUs, but our, our um, uh, um Cray units, and we'll swap out a Cray unit and put in a row of IT. Well, this um, page in front of us right now says things have changed. Deploying 2.1 gigawatts, and these are being deployed in 400, 300 megawatts solution sets. Even colos are being required to put in um, huge 10, 20, 30 megawatt chunks. Um, and so the outcome ends up being OCP is considering and trying to evaluate, is there an industry need for us to try to simplify and standardize the parts of that that can be deployed at scale. Um, there's a lot of controversy here, um, and that's part of the purpose of this call, is to kind of resolve some of that controversy and move forward. So um, just kind of, hopefully I can, oop, what did I do here? Um, there we go. This actually here, our key theme for the past has been, um, uh, don't fear liquid cooling, plan for it, plan for IT, kind of a little pun there. And today's call is uh, looking at that. Um, and we had these uh, reference designs that kind of came out and we have a lot of different work streams. And the purpose of today's call is we're gonna have each one of our um, projects go, uh, and actually maybe I'll, I'll transition to Sean. Um, you said you want to take these slides here, Sean. You want to walk this one through? Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, as Don mentioned, there's a quite a large community here in OCP across IT industry. Um, we go all the way from cloud providers through colos, enterprise integrators to um, DC equipment, IT equipment, and then finally com components. Um, and I think that's one of the unique opportunities that exists within OCP to to bring in uh, a new, you know, new sets of thoughts and ideas across industry, and also uh, bring what's relevant to the community. Um, I think we'll see a lot about liquid cooling in general, but also how it applies all the way through to heat reuse, um, using warmer temperatures to to try and benefit things like domestic heating and that sort of thing. You see some good examples there, but um, cross collaboration is is really um, a big part of what we're doing here. And you're gonna see that as you go through the content today. Okay. Um, so hold on a second. Uh, we... um, go ahead, Sean. Um, yeah, so within OCP, we have um, quite a few different projects and sub-projects. Um, as you can see, we go through, I'm not going to go through all of them, but the, the range goes all the way from networking through um, rack and power through to security and firmware. Um, but we also go up to the DC facility. So a big part of what you'll see is how to deploy hardware all the way from um, things like uh, memory, DIMMs, and, and that sort of different configuration at the system level, and then all the way to racks and at the DC level. Um, and I think that, again, it gives us a unique opportunity as we can try and see some of the collaboration opportunities that exist between various projects, so cooling environments and sustainability. Um, we talked a little bit about heat reuse. Um, we also see hardware management. You'll see a little bit of that on the immersion side where you can start thinking about you know integrated leak detection that could shut off a server, for example, when you detect a leak. Um, so it gives us a unique opportunity when we're trying to integrate some of these work streams together, projects together, sorry. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I think, uh, as you all know, sustainability is now one of OCP's core tenants now, and that's a big part of where we, we see the opportunity for OCP um, as it brings together the other core tenants, efficiency, scalability, openness, and impact. Um, I think sustainability in particular, um, the, the opportunity with liquid cooling is is huge um, as we can really try to take advantage of um, heat um, heat capture and that sort of thing to, to benefit um, various applications. 
Oops, sorry. Uh, let me go back one here. So Sean, why don't you run us through what our organization looks like? Yeah, so as things, as we are right now, um, the incubation committee representative for us is Steve Mills. Um, he's been around, I think, for a long, long time in OCP, probably mo beyond most of us here. So um, he's our IC rep for cooling environments. He used to be on the rack and power side. Um, the the co-leads for cooling environments are myself and, and Don. And then the the door heat exchange lead is John Fernandez um, from Meta. Cold plate is Jordan Johnson from Intel. Um, Immersion is Ralph Brink and John Bean. Um, advanced cooling facilities is John Manos and Cosimo. And then heat release in Jaime. And we are looking for another co lead there. We may have one on board. We'll see how that goes. Uh, one thing I really, uh, Steve Mills, are you online? I'd like to kind of maybe have you give a, a shout out what you actually do and how we actually protect um, our content to make sure that it reflects um, uh, a community approval. I think Steve's on uh, OOP. Don. Yeah, I think oh, he's, uh, okay. he's, he's not here. Yeah. Well, then, um, Sean, why don't you address that? Um, I prefer we get through the content first and then we can maybe come back to that at the end. Okay. Um, so this is the outline of today's discussion. Sean, you want to run through that? Yeah, we'll go through a quick summary of uh, various activities within the, the sub project. So we'll start with heat reuse, go through door heat exchange, a cold plate, immersion, advanced cooling facilities, and finally a call to action. Okay. As we go through this, if anyone has comments, and one of the key things I'd like to highlight is OCP is open compute project is open to everyone on this call. Part of the purpose of this call is to continue to recruit contribution and insights to make sure that uh, we are reflecting the broader community. Um, so as you go through here, you're going to see a lot of opportunities, maybe a QR code um, to take you back to a, a link where you can actually participate in specific work stream calls. These community calls end up being just a, a highlights. Uh, kind of a high speed highlights of what's going on. But the, the work in progress, uh, the opportunity to change our industry, to improve our industry is open to everybody. And that is a, a key aspect of this, plus uh, giving you access to resources that um, right now the industry doesn't have a lot of good answers. Um, and OCP is actually providing a lot of guidance where none exists. So we'll kind of go through here. Um, and uh, Jaime, are you available? Yes, I am. Can you can you see me? Can you hear me? I hear you. Uh, I got a kind of a. I'll, yeah. I'll drop my <laughs> mug off the screen here. I don't want to take. Uh, okay, uh, very good. So, so well, here is you. <laughs> you briefly mentioned it before. Um, uh, Don, uh, it was open not not long ago. We we'll say one half years ago. And uh, since then, we have learned a lot. I mean, we have had a lot of uh, guest presentations, more than 20. And uh, those guest presentations are well attended, usually, with more than 40 people, sometimes reaching 90 people. And uh, we have uh, advanced, uh, uh, also, we have started to, to write down a guidance, like a white paper, pretty large. And we have realized that at some point, we needed to focus on some, some topics. And that's why recently we opened work streams. Actually, one of them is running just right now is, a, is an unfortunately collision. So I will, after presenting this, I will leave and join the other work stream. This is the reference design. The other work streams are TC analysis and policies around heat reuse. These three, let's say, teams, topics are, are, are quite important to treat in a separate way. And that's why we have opened, uh, following the example of immersion uh, subproject, open work streams and it's working well. Actually, they will attend it with a couple of people working focused on, on one topic and this will generate hopefully parts of our future white paper of, uh, of our guidance white paper. Besides this, we have done uh, uh, an article, a short article, the Heat Reuse 101, which is already, already has been published. It's the first approach to Heat Reuse topic. And uh, we also have a, uh, done a Heat Reuse map, which is in constant evolution. Um, you can, maybe go to the next slide by the way i mean you go just back again sorry you have the qr code on top the slide before please uh, done you have the qr code there uh, at the top right if you scan it you can go to a wiki page with uh, the whole information i think it's pretty updated but if you find something let, let, let me know next slide please 
that's the Hydrus map uh, I was talking about. Uh, you see a lot of dots, most of them in Europe. These are these represent each dot represents a, a project with a Hydrus application, and uh, the blue dots are projects that are already been done, are working and running, and the red dots are projects that are in elaboration. They are not existing projects yet, but uh, there, there is still like it's a concept or there is a, is a project that is just not not being built already. Next slide, please. If you click on the on each dot, you have uh, access. You can click on and go to a spreadsheet where you can fill it in with uh, the details of each project. This is, of course, uh, thought for and, and the people that work for the companies or or that are involved in those projects, so they can help us to to gather this data. Um, but we are realizing that uh, probably we will need to personally contact each one of these these companies to to gather this data. This data will be very important and will enrich this this map a lot and help a lot the community. Next slide, please. Next topic um, was was mentioned in the in the first slide, but I haven't talked about is a checklist. This is a, it's not a workshop yet, but will be probably. And the checklist is um, is we only have sketched let's say the the, the principles of this checklist. Uh, but it's still to be defined what we want to do exactly with that. The idea behind that is to to create an assessment checklist for new developments, developments to come, to see how far they are from from a potential heat reuse project or for existing projects, for existing developments, to see as well how far they are for from potential uh, integrations of heat reuse projects in, into them. And uh, next slide, the last one. It's just a call to action. Yeah, I mean, we have the three work streams. Please join them and work in a focused way uh, for defining and quantifying the TCO of of, uh, of uh, a heat reuse project. This is this is something we uh, we are trying to to work uh, in a in a common way. Um, also, um, I mean, to define the the the, the cost of a standard uh, heat reuse project. There is no standard heat reuse project, but we want to kind of see the common elements of any potential heat reuse project that uh, that could happen as well the 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 reference designs uh, we, what we want to do is also in a similar way as acf has done so far is to make some drawings and some tables or with materials uh, being involved in the in the heat reuse project and the last one is also the regulations because these will play a, a crucial role uh, um, in some of the countries especially in Europe, uh, um, for uh, in, including heat reuse projects in, in, with data centers. And last but not least is the matchmaking platform. This is not something we have started yet, but it's something that we have been talking since a long time about it. Um, and this is uh, about making like a Tinder for data centers heat reuse, like bringing together uh, actors from the industry willing to take the excess heat from data centers and data centers willing to give away or even sell and that uh, excess heat that they are producing, and and that's pretty much all. As as, uh, really as yeah, as Don said, we are looking for somebody else uh, to call it this uh, this uh, project. We might have somebody, um, and well, I think Cosimo is here, so I will say him hello <laughs> from the other side. <laughs> and, uh, hi, hi. <laughs> see you around. <laughs> yeah. So Cosimo, as of two weeks ago, was in heat reuse, and he recently transferred, transitioned to ACF, Advanced Cooling Facilities. One thing I would like to highlight as you look at this is OCP, Open Compute Project, is constantly in um, expanding the envelope of it, um, uh, their community, if you will. And uh, if you think back to our origins, which is uh, primarily an IT rack and what's inside the IT rack, that didn't include and doesn't include the expertise needed to that we need to advance these discussions on heat reuse. So we have a much broader community, in fact, even going well beyond the data center box. We actually are trying to reach out to the people, um, and maybe Jaime, you want to explain a little bit more about the challenge of who we need to bring into OC, uh, to heat reuse? Yes, when I mentioned it before, I mean all this this topic with regulations and subsidies that are being involved that we are involved with in uh, with uh, with the heat reuse projects are requiring some some people with knowledge uh, around this, and of course people around the um, yeah district heating companies, utilities, and so on would be very interesting to to get them for our for our workstream and our sub project. 
So the appeal on this call is not just for the people on this call, but making sure that we actually, if you know of people that we should be having on these uh, committees and these, um, we definitely need to expand who OCP, who the Community of Open Compute Project is. So moving on to our next, uh, our first of the ACS lines, the Advanced Cooling Solutions. I'm going to introduce you to John Fernandez, I believe, uh, Door Heat Exchanges. Hopefully, John, you're speaking today. There you are. Yeah, uh, thanks, Don. Um, hey, everyone. My name is John Fernandez. I am a thermal engineer in Meta's hardware team, and I support the Door Heat Exchanges subproject. Um, just a quick update on um, efforts that are currently ongoing um, in the community. Um, the ones that are highlighted as uh, planning or discussion ongoing are actually efforts that will be uh, presented at the OCP Global Summit. So uh, we look forward to seeing everyone uh, come and uh, participate in that. Uh, the first one, the first one is a white paper um, that's being uh, prepared with the uh, modular data center subproject under the data center facilities uh, track. Um, and it involves uh, densifying modular data centers with hybrid cooling. Um, hybrid cooling over here is, is a term that we use to, um, to identify a, a rack that is 100% liquid cooled uh, through the combination of uh, director chip cold plates as well as uh, a door heat exchanger. Um, so Carl Rabe and uh, David, um, who are quite involved in the modular data center, uh, Subproject are working with the Door Heat Exchange community to put this um, effort together. Um, secondly, um, we have engagement from um, an uh, aluminum microchannel uh, heat exchanger vendor um, to write a white paper about um, how this technology, which is quite uh, prevalent in the HVAC industry, um, compares with the incumbent um, solution that is uh, used in traditional door heat exchangers um, and basically compare these two options and where the pros and cons and, and, and opportunities lie. Um, this will also be presented at the Global Summit. And then finally, um, an effort that's being uh, driven by Meta is um, looking into the door heat exchanger as a part of the facility, or as we like to put it, a frame-based deployment um, of door heat exchangers. Um, and then in this effort, we're looking at multiple aspects. One of them is, um, you know, ensuring that this solution can interface seamlessly with um, OCP's latest uh, rack architecture, which is OpenRack V3 as well as what are considerations for integration and sourcing at scale, right? And then beyond that, just general feedback that we can get from the door heat exchanger community and anyone else who's interested uh, will factor into this effort. Um, we, we had um, an effort with the ACS cold plate subproject where we were looking at um, sustainability in terms of circular economy um you know we were looking at the the hybrid cooling solution as a baseline we decided to put that on hold because uh, one of our uh, colleagues who was involved on the sustainability side um uh, you know was impacted um and you know we're looking to uh, potentially um restart this um you know maybe after the global summit um, and start looking into this again because that's a uh, that's an important area to focus on. Um, one last thing I'd like to say is, um, you know, we the community over here is always looking for um, areas where um, we can make contributions, but focus more on lowering the barrier to adoption for a lot of the folks out there who are interested in liquid cooling. So. Um, if we have people in the general community who would like to see a certain type of development um, in the door heat exchanger community, please join the calls. Um, you can use the QR codes over here. And um, in fact, we do have our biweekly call immediately after this meeting. Um, so if you're interested, please join. Please help contribute um, to build robust solutions through OCP. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. 
Um, and let's see, up next, we've got the Cold Plate group. Uh, Jordan, do you have a couple of about five minutes here to give us a quick review of Cold Plate? Yeah, thanks, Don. <clears throat> yeah, so um, I just want to highlight kind of the, you know, similar to John, the, the ongoing community-led discussions. Um, I think there's a couple different tracks through uh, Cold Plate, right? There's, there's these open work streams where the community kind of came and said, hey, this is something you know, we want to lower that barrier to entry. We want to address this issue. We want to help, you know, solve this problem for people that maybe don't know about this. Um, and those are those are our ongoing work streams uh, with community involvement. So we have um, an active cold plate requirements document led by Cam Turner uh, with Cool IT. That's currently in the final review process. Um, and then as part of that process, we kind of identified a a, a desire to understand the technology on the passive cold plate. So I'm kind of using active and passive loosely here. Um, active in this case, just meaning probably what you think of a cold plate, right? Like fluid getting pushed through a loop by a CDU through your cold plate on your um, CPU. And then passive is more like a loop heat pipe type solution. Um, so these have a lot of kind of parallels. So they're, they're kind of parallel documents, um, but the technology was different enough that there's a separate requirements document. So um, Right, this this kind of just came about by the community looking at the state the industry's in, kind of how how can we lower that barrier to entry? Um, and has been a great many different individual contributors and companies coming together to give this high level overview of you know what you need to consider, what the key um, you know parameters of interest are if you're implementing this cold plate solution. Another ongoing work stream um, led by Glenn Charest is a ORV3 blind mate interfaces. Um, if you've attended the Global Summit, I'm sure you've seen him talk about this. Uh, we do have, he does have a preliminary design document coming and will be showcasing this at the Global Summit um, in Iraq at the Meta booth. Uh, so that would be definitely something worth checking out uh, next couple months. Um, a couple other kind of not necessarily work streams, but they came through the cold plate, right? Again, these, uh, Communities working together, um, people identifying problems, doing this work, writing these white papers to help enable the industry. Um, one example of that is this large manual interoperable uh, quick connector led by Noman Mithani. This is actually up on the contribution portal at OCP, so you can go check that out if that is um, something of value to you. It was also um, kind of in preliminary review, looking at a rack manifold requirements for essentially a manifold in this ORV3 rack infrastructure. Um, but maybe if you're if you're still using those, you know, universal quick disconnects or other connectors, um, just what would what would you need to look at in terms of requirements and qualifying a manifold like that? Um, and then something else kind of in the works now led by um, um, Jarrett. Jarrett, I think John, I don't know, I, I might have got the name wrong. Um, but, yeah, it is. Uh, Jared, right? Is Jared Wyatt. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So um, a couple of years ago, there was kind of this OCP collaboration, just looking at the need for a white paper in the data center. Um, and now Jared has gone, you know, really done good design for the needs at Meta um, and is is working on a white paper and maybe a specification as well to share kind of all those design learnings and, um, you know, what are the strict requirements that any data center would need versus, um, right, what what can maybe change depending on your use case. So that's that's super high level. I've got Don just a couple more slides I'll go through super quick um, just to highlight the work streams. Um, if you could go to the next slide. This one or is the uh, next one? The uh, next one. So um, that cold plate requirements document, um, it is revision two. Uh, again, this was a lot of work was put in by the community to, to develop these white papers on leak detection, integration, universal quick disconnects, um, all this stuff that was mentioned in the first cold plate requirements document. Um, and so we don't want there to be conflicting standards or, or have to try to go update all these documents every time one thing changes. Um, so one big reason is this new document will just point to all that more in-depth work um, that is out there on the contribution portal and available to everybody. Um, while also updating to a new template and just taking into account kind of new technologies and um, right the the current needs and, and understandings in this industry. The uh, the next slide 
just super high overview. Again, Glenn Stress leads this work stream. Um, this is developing BlindMate interfaces for the ORV3 um, kind of full solution with the plugs in the IT gear and then a floating valve in the manifold uh, to take into account the tolerance stack up there. So um, yeah, that's, that's very high level. Um, you know, similar to what John said, if there's something you see a need for, or you you want to come propose something to help lower this barrier to entry, um, we're absolutely open to it. That's our that's our goal. What is the community need? What is the community um, you know able to share to help the industry adopt liquid cooling um, and cold plate cooling going forward? I appreciate that. The forecast I hear is there's going to be a lot more um, uh, cold plate products hitting the marketplace uh, in the next couple of months. Um, so it's a uh, very timely um, uh, guidance and discussions. Uh, so Rolf for John, you got five minutes. Yep. Uh, I've just uh, took over the screen sharing. Uh, don't hope you don't mind because there's a couple of different uh, slides. Uh, there's some uh, changes to the immersion uh slides since the last call uh so i'll just take you guys uh through it uh quickly um uh and let me start with the org chart of the immersion uh community which is an enormous community where uh we have a lot of work that is being done in the community by all the various works team leads we have <laughs> we have this month uh, uh, started uh, accepted the uh, introduction of a new work stream alongside all the current ones. Uh, I'll do a very quick run over the various activities that we're doing. Uh, hardware management, uh, or, sorry, start all the way on the left. Uh, design guidelines for IT equipment is one that is currently inactive, uh, uh, but we're looking to potentially revive that uh, in the next half year or so. Uh, to come up with new design guidelines for IT equipment. Uh, initial paper was uh, already published uh, a couple of years back. Um, hardware management for liquid cooling is one that crosses uh, various uh, ACS solutions, but also basically uh, affects the entire uh, CE domain. We've, we've been sponsoring that uh, uh, the project and helping out with uh, governance and, uh, and structure of it. Um, Fluids and materials is one of the more important groups led by Puny and Peter uh, from respectively Shell and Submar. Uh, that's where all material compatibility and fluid specifications are dealt with in that team. And they're very active. I got a, got a brief update on uh, some of the actions that they've set out that I've put in motion as well. The immersion requirements, uh, I've got an update on that as well. It's led by myself and Rick Margerson. Um, uh, I will have an update, a quick update on that uh, soon. This is where we, uh, similar to what the cold plate requirements is, uh, we're also releasing a new version, uh, version 2.1, uh, shortly. Power distribution and immersion is a group that has started earlier this year, um, and they're looking at the power distribution specifications that are required uh, for an immersion. Uh, immersion obviously is a different beast than air cooling. Uh, taking the open rec v3 principles into an immersion tank is not as straightforward as some might think uh, and this group is looking at how to deal with the rv3 power delivery specs and how to adjust some of those specs uh, and methods of delivering power to become more suitable with immersion Immersion cooling hurdles is one of our more strategic work streams. This is where uh, the, this is led by David Gunazian and Raul Alvarez. Uh, they're both independent. Um, this group is actively seeking out reasons why you should not be working with immersion, so that we can focus. Uh, so that to, and that applies a focus for our activities uh, with the immersion community. Uh, so the primary task for that group is to scope out uh, hurdles and challenges related to immersion uh, and formulate uh, the baseline for the creation of uh, of new work streams that uh, that will have community uh, community attention and, and a community desire to work in. Um, there are various topics dealt dealt with in there, and I do expect that there's going to be some more work streams formulated in the next half year or so as well, uh, coming from that group. 
Uh, OEI, I've got a brief update on that momentarily, uh, is a collaboration between the Open Accelerator infrastructure team within Open Compute, one of the other projects that falls under the server top level project uh, to ensure that future accelerators are, are tolerant to immersion cooling uh, and potentially even designed for the purpose of being immersed. TCO modeling uh, is run by Eddie Reutman and Alison Boone, and that's where we're looking at the creation of an open TCO tool to help with assessing where the cost uh, cost benefits of immersion lies. Eventually, we will be looking at expanding that tool to also include cold plate approaches and door heat exchanges uh, to ensure that we can cover all the domains of liquid cooling. Initially, uh, this project or this work stream is focused on generating that open TCO model uh, in the context of immersion. And there is a model already selected to work with uh, that is already a working model, uh, but needs re needs further refinement, which is what that group is currently doing. Now we have the warranty guidelines for immersion cool IT. Sadly, reality today is still that most IT equipment, when it gets immersed or even gets uh, gets near immersion fluid, warranty is voided. This is something that this work stream is trying to address with guidelines. Uh, and that's led by Rich Lappenbush and Michael Cordell. Uh, signal integrity uh, is a highly technical uh, topic uh, where the integrity of high speed communications may be affected by, uh, by immersion uh, due to the different properties of the, of the immersion fluids compared to air. Um, and this, we're talking about dielectric properties, which which affect uh, signal quality. Uh, this group is uh, tasked with uh, identifying uh, the specific elements that are uh, affecting signal integrity and mitigation strategies for this as well. And finally, we have the new work stream. Uh, it's component validation. Uh, it's a component validation case study work stream uh, submitted and also led by Peter Liu from Formerica Opto Electronics. Uh, and that group, uh, that work stream is focused on mapping out the current uh, ecosystem in the market to. Uh, identify which parties you can work with uh, when you do, when you're trying to get a component validated with the lack of standards industry standards or certification processes uh, uh, for related to component validation for immersion uh, this is deemed to be a very uh, important group, uh, important effort to help map out this ecosystem, to identify which bodies uh, should be should have which capabilities and what type of uh, relations you need to set up in the industry to ensure that you can you can appropriately validate a component without having to redo the work for every different uh, solution or uh, uh, or immersion variation again. Uh, having said that, I'm just going to go into some very quick updates, uh, some notable advances in the community. Uh, first one is uh, managed by the Fluids and Materials Group, but also uh, supported by the, um, for some of this work, by the Immersion Requirements uh, Community. Um, there are various topics that needed to be addressed. So instead of addressing it with the broader community, uh, a couple of focus groups, uh, temporary focus groups have been assembled and have been assigned with very specific topics to create one pages or three pages um, with a very limited scope, very specific ask and um, to help kickstart some, some highly needed reference material in the industry. One of the most notable ones is the immersion FMEA study where we're going to be looking in the failure mode and effective analysis of immersion cooling technology as an industry domain. Uh, so not on a specific solution but uh, um, but on the generic application of immersion cooling. The initial focus is to uh, to determine appropriate values for flash points and auto ignition point of the um, of immersion fluids out there in the market uh, and that is the 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 goal is that we're going to be able to provide some underlying materials uh, to i e c uh, to help establish appropriate um, uh, appropriate figures for those uh, for those uh, safety points. Uh, 
this has already been prepared by Amy Short, who's done some excellent work on this, uh, and calls are expected to be starting in the next uh, next couple of weeks. Uh, other groups that have already started this uh, this work uh, are on oxidation stability of the fluids, uh, component level material compatibility. Uh, uh, some work has already been done on. Uh, on addressing cleaning procedures for IT equipment, the safe handling of fluids where health and safety comes in, uh, uh, and, and more like this. Uh, this is work that is ongoing in, in small focus groups, and we're expecting uh, uh, results out of these groups within the next couple of months, hopefully before the global summit. Um, a notable update from power distribution and immersion. Um, Interesting discussion is currently taking place regarding the uh, 48 volts versus 51 volts use of uh, uh, in the OpenREC version three. Uh, and why is this of interest? I'm just going to skip over to the slides. Uh, when using higher voltage, slightly higher voltage, we're seeing a 10% increase in effectiveness and efficiency, or a 10% 10, 10 Delta in uh, uh, in, vol in, in, uh, in voltage loss over uh, in power loss over the bus bar. Uh, so currently, the uh, this group is liaising directly with the Rec and Power community to discuss, uh, and also with the server community uh, to discuss the pot uh, potential increase of voltage uh, uh, to use as a baseline in immersion systems where we are typically. Uh, pursuing much higher power densities and higher power uh, uh, per, per rack. Um, Mick Jones has also made some significant progress with the hardware management approach. Um, uh, uh, currently, uh, most of the work is done uh, with this community. Um, the last major requirement to be specified relates to the interoperability pro, uh, profiles. Uh, and after this, there will be a focus on the creation of mockups and examples uh, and message, message, message registries uh, and the creation, the actual creation of the interoperability profiles and schema iterations. Um, so there will be closing out topics on security and control policy as well. So there are some significant advantage made in, uh, in that area. And we're uh, hopefully we'll be seeing uh, the light at the end of the tunnel soon uh, for this work stream uh, to come up uh, to publish uh, an open schema for liquid cooling in general. Um, for the immersion requirements, as mentioned, uh, there's a new release coming up. Uh, the uh, revision 2.1 is now fully completed. I will be submitting it to the IC this month, and uh, we're looking at a publication date of that, uh, hopefully well before the global summit. So that will be great. Uh, next actions for this work stream is to, to, to further support the FMEA study and uh, to focus on some other areas. We're currently talking about um, uh, fluid uh, monitoring, quality monitoring, and how that can be done in immersion tanks, what kind of equipment, what kind of uh, fluid properties will need to be uh, managed going forward. And finally, as a last um, uh, notable update, um, with the Open Accelerator Infrastructure Hum, uh, uh, Collaboration. Uh, one of the difficulties that we're seeing is that it's difficult to get thermal analysis information from the current vendors. That's where most of the thermal analysis is being done on various platforms. Why is it difficult? It is difficult because uh, thermal modeling typically includes a lot of uh, proprietary information uh, that goes that comes along with uh, an individual solution. So there is a lot of IP sensitivity out there. Uh, for this reason, we've done an, uh, a university outreach um, to uh, uh, to request. Uh, uh, to request um, uh, uh, some support in the creation of an open CFD environment. Uh, I'm not referring to new tooling or open, open source tooling for this, but for the creation of an environment in which we can collectively run thermal modeling. Uh, obviously, the initial focus coming from this collaboration is on, is on the accelerated chips, 
but we're also uh, we're also anticipating uh, that we that we will want to run uh, more generic simulations uh, and analysis in collaboration with various other work streams and projects within OCP to evaluate suitability and performance optimization in immersion. Uh, current discussions are ongoing with one of the universities that is aligned with OCP Future Technologies. Uh, if that doesn't uh, lead to a direct result, we'll do a broader outreach to educational institutes around the world to gauge further interest uh, uh, for, collabor for so, collaborative activity. We do need to get uh, to activity. some other discussions today. So, um, as, ma as I mentioned, these were the, lights, the last slides done. Uh, so I'm wrapping up here. We've uh, been wrapping up for 10 minutes. <laughs> Okay, well, uh, I'll I'll be happy to give you a time back, uh, Don, uh, uh, because I'll leave it at this. Uh, so so far, the emotion update. Hey, I appreciate that, Rolf, and I didn't mean to cut you off too much, but uh, um, uh, and we'll try to get you more time next call. Um, so the last person, uh, last topic, real quick, is um, the ACF Advanced Cooling Facilities. And before we do that. Want to re-emphasize what we started out with the slide was is 2.1 gigawatts if you look at it that's 2100 cdus if you're deploying to it racks that's 1700 feet of headers 35 or 32 miles of headers 84,000 branch lines our industry um there's a question whether or not we can do that good news is acf has already been looking advanced cooling facilities has been looking at and doing work streams on cdus on uh header distribution on branch lines and so with that, I'm going to pass this off to Cosimo and have him talk about uh, advanced cooling facilities, work streams, and where we're going with that. So first of all, let me say that I'm jealous of Rolf's organization and successes. <laughs> but so you all heard of all these uh, different work streams and projects and all these different, the different technologies. What we try to do at the ACF, at Advanced Cooling Facilities, is to actually put all these technologies inside a facility, a building, and how to uh, uh, interface and in interact with them and make them uh, work as smooth as possible. So uh, this is the, the, the scope and the goal of, of this group, uh, put all these the, the, um, technologies together. And uh, in order to do that, currently we have five uh, work streams that they are here in front of you. So um, concurrent maintainability, beam specifications, so that actually if you, if you need to put these technologies in your building, you find the beam files uh, easily, they are easily accessible and, and you can work with them. Uh, physical parameters, of course, and uh, and and then collocation assessment, and uh, uh, ultimately, as Don was saying, cooling distribution units or or CDUs. All these in the in the in in the hope that uh, we will make the job of you guys designing the buildings a little easier. Um, Again, I just rejoined this this group after a couple of years uh, in uh, in heat reuse. We it's it's summertime. A lot of people are on vacation, so so it's the give us give us sometimes to re-coordinate. But we definitely need more people that are interested in joining and be active in these uh, subgroups. So please, if you have an interest or uh, or if your job somehow uh, overlaps with these uh, five uh, work groups, send us a note, and we will be very happy to uh, include you in the in in in, in the work. Um, uh, next slide, please. I'm trying to go fast here because we are really running out of time. Um, a challenge that that we will uh, that we will face. Let's say that I'm, I'm hesitant here because uh, we are going through a kind of a boutique business to a, a scale business. And we were discussing here at the beginning of the call, I don't know if everybody was present, but um, uh, the deployment of liquid cooling at the moment, really in August 2023, is not yet at scale, but definitely the attention to be ready for the liquid cooling is at scale. And that has a very deep implications on the building, uh, on on the facility, and has very deep implications on how you make sure that they can, that you are able to uh, if, uh, uh, adapt your cooling system with the evolution of, of of the technology. And if everything that you use is 
proprietary and is designed around a specific parameters, the temperatures and pressure drops and, and, and pipe size and connections, then it becomes very, very hard in the future, two, three years down the road, four years down the road, 10 years down the road, because buildings are supposed to last 30 years to swap for different technologies. So what we are trying to work here is to um, understand what would be the interest in, uh, in uh, creating some consensus around uh, an, an easier uh, uh, swappability of uh, equipment. This is just an idea. And I, I would say the question that we want to ask in, is how to make your building future proof. This, this is the question. And, and we want to get your ideas, your answers, and, and then put them uh, possibly in a project or in a white paper. Um, in a nutshell, really, this is what uh, we are trying to do with advanced cooling facilities. Uh, join our calls if you're interested. I can guarantee you that they are relatively fun. There's a lot of passionate people that talk at length about very detailed <laughs> aspects. And uh, I, I, I think that we need to leave four or five minutes for questions and, and feedback. So I'll, uh, I'll give it back to you, Don. Well, I appreciate that. One thing I would like to highlight is each one of these uh, pictures you show here, ACF has had a work stream on school and distribution units. They've had work streams on uh, distribution headers and requirements. We've had work streams on, on branch lines. We are revisiting some of those work streams now to optimize them for cloud scale deployment. Initially, the, the discussions were all around a boutique deployment, um, but when you go to cloud scale, as, as uh, Cosmo was indicating, the ability to get circularity circularity and sustainability into your data center design, the ability to transition, say, from a door heat exchanger to a door heat exchanger plus cold plate someday in the future. How can we minimize the facility impact on those kind of transitions? Um, let me, without, let's, actually, let, let, let me add a, a, a very quick comment. If you, part of the audience here, are end users, are uh, the, the data center operators, Consider that Don and I and many other people here uh, come from the, the vendor point of view. So we provide you solutions. To go from boutique to scale takes years. We are talking about building new factories. We are talking about establishing new uh, su supply chain. It takes time. So we need to be up absolutely on the same page when it comes to the future of your business and what you are looking at, not two months down the road, Two years down the road, because this is the, the time frame that it's going to take for vendors to be ready to provide your solutions at scale. So we don't have much time to play around. Not when they're adding 2.1 gigawatts in 90 days. Okay, that's just uh, jaw dropping. So anyway, uh, we only have a couple minutes left. Um, our call to action here, these are links you can scan to um, join the, the different groups. I'm going to have to skip over that. They also just go to the OCP uh, opencompute.org page and you'll find in a project you can come to us. I do want to close real quick with a uh, highlight that we're going to have. Uh, and for those that want to hear a lot more of Rolf, he got a full day of Rolf coming down on OCP Global Summit. Um, and so... Uh, uh, and I, I mean that in, in all sincerity, the, the uh, immersion group is is doing a ton of, uh, of contribution in our community, and you'll have many opportunities for to hear them uh, coming up October 17th to 19th um, at the OCP Global Summit in San Jose. With that, we got like three minutes left. Um, Sean, do you want to kind of close out? Uh, yeah, I um, I did want to. Sorry, I need to get my camera on. I did want to point out that you know it's not just. Uh, role for the emerging communities representing all the work of the community and I think uh, that's why he speaks so passionately about him we appreciate it um, and John Bean will be joining him so um, thank you for that role for John um, I did want to say um, thank you to the, the folks that joined today um, as you can see there's a wide variety of work we're doing it from all the way from the um, immersion cooling through the coal plate door heat exchanger all the way through the facility side um, and you starting to see some some great examples of how that's all coming together. Um, so appreciate everyone joining, and we'll see you in the next call. Uh, just just a little clarification: it's not just me or John. It's mostly the work stream leads that are putting up all the real uh, getting the hands dirty bit. So just want to want to point that out to everyone here as well. It's uh, 
is the community uh, works in leadership that is really digging in, that's doing all the grunt work, getting all this uh, this material out. So um, and they will have uh, they will have the opportunity to spend a lot of time that day together with the heat reuse project, by the way. Right, uh, that is also the same day as uh, immersion. So looking forward to meeting everybody there. Thanks, Ralph. Thank you very much. And Ralph, I do want to kind of say I'm just amazed with the organization you built and the depth that you've covered a very challenging topic of uh, roping together what immersion can be in the future. And it's got great potential. So um, appreciate all your contribution and also the attendance today. Um, any other questions? I'll leave the mic open. Well, I'm going to turn the mic off and people can make any comments they want. Um, well, I think 